Whatever you believe about how best to learn for you is probably incorrect. What are the habits that the most successful students seem to incorporate over and over again? Fortunately, today you will learn the best ways to study. Now let's talk about how the best students structure their days. Turns out there are great studies on this. There's a really nice paper surveyed close to 700 students. These were medical students, approximately equal number of male and female students, and analyzed the most useful learning habits. There are at least 10 study habits that the highly effective students use. I'm gonna focus on the top five or six. First of all, they set aside time to study. They literally schedule time to study. Now this probably serves several roles. The first one is that they are able to clear out other distractions. And in fact, that's the second thing that they do. They are very effective or they make it a point of putting their phone away and off of isolating themselves, that's right, they're not studying with other people, they study alone, they put their phone away, they tell their friends and families that they are not going to be able to be reached during that time. And yes, they study for three or four hours per day, but they break that up into a couple of different sessions typically, two or three sessions. So they're not doing a three or four hour studying about all in one shot. To the extent that you have any control over the time in which you're going to study, keeping that at a regular time or times, perhaps one block early in the day, one block later in the day, perhaps two blocks early in the day and so on, is going to be beneficial. It turns out that's also supported by the research literature that the brain, just like with its sleep-wake cycles that entrain to a regular schedule, that is your brain and body get used to being active and inactive at particular times based on your exposure to sunlight, your exposure to activities, your social rhythms, et cetera. If you regularly, meaning for the course of about three days, make it a point to focus and study at particular times, again, pulling your attention back, it's not an automatic process, but pulling your attention back to a specific location, perhaps on a page or that you're listening to in a lecture, your body and brain will start to entrain to that rhythm such that you will be able to focus and attend better simply by virtue of the regularity of the timing of the exposure to the material. The other thing that they do, and this is very important, is that they make an effort to then teach their peers, to teach other students in the class. Now, some of you may be thinking that if you spend all this time learning the information and you are in a competitive scenario with the other students, that teaching them the information is kind of a freebie for them and is harder for you, meaning you're putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage or you're giving them an unfair advantage for not having done the work. Now, while this paper didn't do an analysis of whether or not these students that served as the learners from the other students got an unfair advantage, it's very clear that students who make it a point to learn material in isolation, then bring that material to other students in the same course and teach them, perform exceedingly well in comparison to the other students. So don't be afraid to be a teacher of your peers in order to test, this is key, to test and develop mastery of the material. If ever there was a strongly research supported tool in the literature, in the peer reviewed literature about how students can learn information better, it's testing. And I know, I know, I know, we think of tests as a way to evaluate our knowledge, but it turns out that testing is one of the best ways to build our knowledge, to retain our knowledge, and again, to offset forgetting. There's a classic study that was done in 1917 where grade school age children read biographies. So they read biographies and then the kids were divided into different groups. One group read and reread and reread those biographies over and over. Another group read the biographies once and then were tested on those biographies. But get this, they tested themselves on those biographies simply by having to think about the information that they had read and trying to remember the information, like what was the biography? Who was the person? Who were they married to? What did they do? When did they go to school? What did they do in school? Now keep in mind here that even though it's fairly apparent that reading a biography two, three, four times might seem more passive than testing oneself on a biography that they had read just once. And yet when you look at the percent of accurate recall of information from those biographies, 
the children that read the biography once and then made a deliberate point to think about that biography in their own mind to effectively test themselves on that material just within their heads over and over, vastly outperformed the kids that read the biographies over and over. Put differently, reading and rereading material and re 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 reading material is far less effective than reading material and then thinking about that material, testing yourself on that material, forcing yourself to bring that material to mind in your own mind. And this is not just for sake of remembering more volume of material, but also accuracy of recall of that material.